Hello and welcome to the Kutish County 4-H photography video on photography composition. So a little overview, some ideas on how to better compose your photo photographs, improve your, your skills in photography. This is Roger Sherman. I'm the county photography leader. Uh, so <clears throat> the first few slides here, about five or six, have to do with positional, how to compose the viewpoint of the picture in your camera. And we'll start out with the ever famous rule of thirds. So if you're brand new to photography, you may not have heard of rule of thirds, but if you've been do doing any sort of photography for any sort of time, you will hear rule of thirds all the time. And rule of thirds is, is actually shown visually in two example photographs here. Of, the, of both the cat and uh, this one. I think this is uh, seen in like Iceland, but it's a beautiful picture. And the concept here is you divide your picture, your frame into thirds horizontally and vertically. And with the rule of thirds, the idea is at these intersections of those thirds are a great place to put your major point of interest in your picture. So for this picture, all the water flowing from the waterfalls and landing in this pool is in this lower quarter. And right at the sort of the, the mountain itself here, the peak is sort of running along the, the right third of this picture. The rule of thirds really gets to the idea that you don't necessarily want to center all of your pictures. We'll talk next slide about centering pictures because there are definitely pictures that make sense to have centered. But an awful lot of pictures, probably more pictures than not, it probably doesn't make uh, sense to have them centered simply because it's actually going to be more visually pleasing if they're a little bit off of center. And the rule of third grid is really helpful there. So if we centered on this cat, I don't think the picture would be nearly as nice. But the way it is here with the cat offset to the right side and right on this dividing line of the third horizontal, if you will. And really the kind of the heart of the cat that's in focus is right at that corner, that intersection there. That makes, I think, for a very attractive uh, picture. And uh, there's a number of things you'll find in a lot of these pictures is as we talk about different ideas for how to compose your picture, most pictures have many of those ideas involved in a single picture. In this case, we have a very narrow depth of field, and we'll talk more about depth of field as a composition. And this this third picture is a great example of the rule of thirds. That, and I, I grabbed a picture that didn't have these first two pictures straight from the web with the lines already drawn on them. This one didn't have lines drawn on them, but it's a great example of if you if you take a third, if you this is the same width as this picture. So if you drew that third line right down, where is it? It goes right smack across the boat here. And if you went a third of a line right here, you'd have an intersection right there. And so that boat just stands out. It's beautiful. Obviously, the sunset is beautiful. Later on, we'll talk about layers. You see a, a whole series of layers in this picture. We have the foreground. We have the ocean behind the boat. We have the, the you know, darkened or the the crimson sun, uh, sunset in the, the horizon here, as well as the colder sky where the sun has kind of left this part of the sky is no longer lighting up this part of the sky. So there's a lot of layers in this picture too, which is something we'll talk about later, but it's a good example. Could, could have taken it. Now, that was great. Hey, the, you know, the first slide, put things off to the side, don't center them. That's that example. There are other times when you definitely want to center your shot. And there's some examples here. This very dramatic picture of the statue. I think it's probably Atlas or some such thing. I think this is a famous picture. I should have done some research where it is. And it's, and it's also sort of framed by the building itself. And then you have the building going up. So there's a lot of different constructs going in here. We're centering this picture. Later on, we're going to talk about the concept of leading lines. Great example of some leading lines going on here. 
Uh, later on, we're going to talk about the concept of composing your pictures using black and white. And this is obviously black and white. And I love black and white. So I, love to, <laughs> I love seeing pictures that are in black and white. But this is a great example of why to center your picture. Here's another one. Talk about your leading lines, too. And we'll talk about those later. But um, we have all of these lines. And basically, this picture makes the most sense with the pillar, the center pillar right down the center of the of the frame instead of being shifted off. It it wouldn't make as nearly as good a picture if it was offset. And then we have this picture of the sundown over. I'm going to guess the Pacific. It may not be the Pacific, but but you have the sun right here, basically center, center of the picture. The ocean forms the bottom third. So we are using the rule of thirds and the fact that the ocean is the bottom third and the top two thirds are the sky and the clouds with the sun. But the sun is dead center. So we didn't offset the sun at all in this picture. And to me, this makes perfect sense. This is a very valid use of center in your shot. Another tool, and I don't, honestly, I don't use this very much, uh, but we're gonna talk about that. So we had the rule of thirds. We had the idea, well, you don't always do the rule of thirds. Sometimes you do center your picture. This one is taking your pictures and if you were to take triangles here and, and so if you took a if you took a line and divided it in half and then took this quarter and went straight down so that you had a a 90 degree a right triangle 90 degrees here and the same thing from this corner to here a right triangle so now you have a series of four right triangles. And these are called the golden triangles. And honestly, I don't use this very much, but I have to look at my pictures now and the concept. I've never kind of mentally carried a model of the golden triangles in my head when I take uh, pictures. But again, it's, it's the thought of, you know, each triangle can be an area of subject, if you will, as well as the intersection of triangles is probably a good place to have points of interest happen. And so we start to see that exa example. Here's the sun peeking through uh, the bell towers and it's right at close to that point of triangle. And if we and if we look, there's sort of different subjects, areas in each of these triangles. Definitely see it in here, different subject areas in each of those triangles. And an example here again, the sun intersects right at the intersection of those triangles. So these are kind of two of the key points. And we see it here in this picture as well. This young lady's hands are re really close to the intersection of these triangles. And this young lady is very close to the intersection of this triangle. And it's sort of that, and it's showing us some depth between, with, and some balance of objects in between there with some depth. And it's black and white. And we know I love black and white. Another one, and this one is more math. So all of these have to do with sort of math and geometry. And, and really our human nature to balance, our find balance, if you will, in a mathematical world. So one of the things, if you, if you study math, one of the things they'll mention is math is really discovered rather than invented. So math has always been there and we're, the human race is just sort of discovering math as we go along. And then what we find is math ties back to physics. You know, if you study physics, you're going to be studying a lot of math and people can't prove the physics without math. So where am I going with all this math stuff? Golden ratio is another very interesting thing and it shows up everywhere in, in, uh, in creation, not only in humans, but life. If you look, this is the shape of a snail and it has this exact ratio and it's called the golden ratio. And how are we getting it? This is, you know, I left these, all these pictures have this golden ratio line in there to help explain what's going on. But if you start with a rectangular and most all of our cameras shoot a rectangular picture. So if you take a rectangular picture and you start from the left, or you could do it from the right. You can start from one either side and you make the big square, your biggest square possible from that one side. So you're gonna use the, the whole height 
and then as much width as it gives you a square. And that gives you a square. And then you go over to the next bit and come down until you have a square. So you're only going to come down as much as you are wide and have a square. And that's going to leave you this. And then you're going to do the same thing and you're going to have a square. And that's going to leave you this. And then you're going to do, and you're going to have a square. And that's going to leave you that. And you're going to have a square. And then you're going to have a square. And a square. And a square. And a square. See? And then you draw a line that touches the perimeter of those squares. And it circles and circles in like a snail. And that's the golden ratio. It's like 1.6 something is what it is. There's some algebra for this. I won't quote the algebra and don't ask me for a pop quiz. But it's a golden ratio. And what it's talking about, here's a great example of what we balance our lives. It really fits into how nature works. And so we intuitively as humans are very pattern driven. We start to see the pattern and see intuitively that it's a pattern that matches something where, and maybe we can't quite put it together, but it's math. It's a pattern of math. It's the golden ratio. And so these are great examples. When we can take an image and it sort of fits well in that golden ratio, it tends to be a very pleasing image. I think this is a great example of those beautiful mountains in the background. And then we have somebody here. We, you know, later on we're going to talk about human interest. I add in human interest to your picture. And this is a beautiful example of that where, where you have this beautiful landscape. But really what gives us a sense of size and scale and distance and the fact that humans live here is we have people in the picture, a person in the picture. And the person is placed in sort of that golden triangle intersection. So the sun is placed in the center of one of these squares as a, as a triangle is formed around. The person over here, her head is placed in the center of one of these squares as we're slowly cycling around. Her eye is in this, you know, right at the intersection of those squares that we circle around. And notice how her cheek and her head is just sort of curves and fits, in, fits into that curve. The hair, uh, the water draining off of the hair. Uh, just just a phys great example of here's a, here's the physicality of the world emulating a golden triangle. This is the physicality of the world manifesting itself in the golden tri triangle. And if you study golden triangle, you'll find a lot of things of physicality of the world that emulate it. So that's the golden triangle. So we've had first, we had the uh, rule of thirds, or, you know, which is kind of a guide. It's not really a rule. Nobody's going to give you a ticket if you don't use it. But think about it. We have the idea that, hey, not you don't always want to do it in thirds. Sometimes you want to center your shot, but you might want to use some of those thirds, but still center your subject. We have the golden triangles, we have the golden ratios, and we have this concept of space. So, the you know, we're off the math here now, but we're extending it with the idea of space. And and so what is that? So that's sort of a rule. All, all of a sudden there's all these rules, but now you shouldn't have so many rules. They call it rules. It's much more about guidelines and thoughts about. But here's the idea with space. You have a picture of somebody speeding along on a bicycle. This is a cool shot. And they would have taken that shot by panning their camera and trying to keep the camera at the same, the movement of the end of their lens at the same pace as the person on the bicycle, which will, and then if the shutter speed is slow enough and you pan like that, then because the shutter speed is slow, you're going to get all this motion blur. But if you can match the end of the, the movement of the end of the lens with your subject area, the subject area is going to be mostly in focus. This isn't quite tack sharp. I've seen people do this and get the subject tack sharp. I haven't had as much luck doing this, but I really envy people that can because uh, it makes for a great picture. But here's the rule of space. The rule of space has to do with the fact that this person is buzzing along. Well, you gotta, you don't want that picture cropped right here with a lot of space behind them, unless there's like a motorboat with a huge wake. 
because really the story, the rule of space here is the story is where is he going? And so we want to show that. We want to give them an indication of what's ahead in telling this story. For this young lady, we want to show the space she's looking into, not the space that's behind her. The only reason we'd want to show something behind her is if maybe her mother was coming up to give her a hug or something like that. That would be a different story. But a story about this young girl just sitting at a table or whatever, whatever she's leaning on, and looking down at something, the space needs to be here. It's called negative space. And we'll talk a little bit more about negative space too. And another great example is this gentleman here. Looks like a samurai warrior because he's got one of those samurai knives. Uh, so beautiful scenery. He's peering out. So you really want, we're following the rule of thirds here. He's pretty much right at that third intersection there. And his head's right about where that third intersection would be. But the rule, of, so we're using the rule of thirds, that's great, but we're also using the rule of space and the fact that where he's looking is open and follow the visual there. And the same here, this uh, young woman is running to her credit, beautiful sundown, <laughs> out there running, very fit, I'm very envious. And, and um, we can see that she's headed in this open negative space and we really want this. And I love, 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 love this picture of this dog. Rule of thirds, we have the dog's head right at the intersection of the third and the top third. And we have this open space the dog's peering into. Okay, so next, one of the next things is often people talk about framing their shot. And framing your shot is looking for natural things or, you know, man-made things that can help the user focus in and draw their eye to the subject of the shot. And framing your shot sometimes will end up with the subject matter sort of centering. Um, it's not unusual when you're framing your shot to end up with a more subject matter centered shot uh, going in there. So it's beautifully framed shot. Um, and here, I'm assuming this is probably India or somewhere in Asia anyway, very very Asian-like looking place. Uh, so you get some mist and fog, but you have somebody taking this from inside the building and using this window or doorway um, to frame the rest of the building out there beautifully done. Here they have a spiral staircase. So you're using the staircase really to frame itself. And this is very much that um, go, uh, golden rule as well. This, if you did the math on this spiral staircase, it's very much like it was a snail and very much like a, the golden rule as well, that are a square. And you could use that and actually show that in, in your picture to help draw the viewer's eye to what it is you wanted them to see. And that's all framing, using a frame. And a lot of times you can also use natural things like trees, for frames or edges of mountains for frames, edges of buildings for frames. Um, other people for frames, you could have uh, two people that are uh, maybe not uh, fully in focus framing the person that is. So leading lines. Um, one of the photography's favorite things is leading lines. Wonderful picture of leading lines, but look at all the lines. Obviously we have the the lines, the natural lines form between the boards. We have the lines with the cracks in the board. We have the lines with all of the uh, slats within the benches and they they go on and on and on. We have all the lines of all this. That is a beautiful picture. We have lines in the buildings as well, right? The windows line up and they're leading lines as well. So all kinds of leading lines in this picture, great picture. This picture here is a roadway. This, I believe this is a winding roadway. I forget what the name of that road is, but I believe this is taken to Door County. Yeah. But it's a great example of how your eye just follows this road and take, it takes you through the picture and takes you through the changes in color in the picture. And then this last one is a black and white. I'm fond of black and whites. Mentioned, I might've mentioned that. Um, and it's an example of framing as well. So here it's this individual's framed, but all these leading lines are showing us right to the center. And this is an example where 
Where this one is, you could say, rule more of a rule of thirds. It kind of leads off to the corner of the picture. But this one is definitely a centered picture. And, and it fits. It works. It makes the most sense. All of this concentric circles with leading lines leading us to a subject. And, and the picture itself, this is the one picture that has a person in the picture. And that really humanizes the picture. Uh, I think in this picture might even be more interesting if we had somebody like about here riding a bicycle on this road and just humanizing this picture um, and showing the purpose for the road. Angles. Another thing for composition is to think about angles. Uh, we're mathematically driven people, even if you don't think you like math. There's a lot of math in our lives uh, and, it, and it just bespeaks itself. And angles will catch our eye and we'll work them. They challenge us a little bit. Angles are less quiet. So they're a little bit more disruptive and they challenge us. They make our minds, they make our minds work. So when we see angles, we're naturally drawn to trying to figure out what's going on in, with the angles. Um, so that challenges our mind. If we had just five strawberries and they went this way across, don't think it would be nearly as good a picture. Also notice the thing, there is five strawberries rather than four. We're gonna talk about that later in a, in a compo composition guidance as well, under the rule of odds, in the fact that there's odd number of strawberries here instead of just four strawberries. Um, and that seems to help a composition oftentimes as well. So the, the angle with the young lady here is kind of cool because she's sort of, sitting and matching her body, some of her body is sort of matching up with the angle of the staircase. So again, it's it's not a relaxing picture. It's causing us to think and consume it because of its angles, but it's also drawing our eyes to the picture itself. So think about angles when you're composing. Uh, color, obviously, as much as I love black and white, and I do, there are certainly lots of good places for color. And uh, if you study the color chart or the color wheel, and I would encourage you to do that, a lot of colors can be complementary colors. And this is a good example of some complementary colors uh, that are all sitting on this blue background and really jumping out or the popsicles jumping out. And so this is a great example of stuff. A lot of these are things you could do in your home, right? So if you're bored, rainy day, I want to take some pictures. Start experimenting a little bit with what you have available. You know, let see if your mom will let you cut up a couple of different types of fruit and take a picture on a cutting board. Because that's pretty cool and pretty pretty straightforward thing you can do. Um, or popsicles. I don't know if she'll be very happy if you unwrap a lot of popsicles. But if you're having a party and having a lot of folks over and everybody's going to have popsicles, maybe, maybe you get them to contribute to your popsicles for a few minutes. You take the picture before they consume them. And this one, this is, looks like beaches, beach houses is, you know, at a, at a beach. Patterns and textures. And I'll apologize. This first one, I kind of doubt it's a photograph, but it's so cool looking that I just had to throw it in there because it was like, I looked at this, I love pattern and texture. And I was looking at that and it's like, oh man, that just, you, you could take that, that and hang it on a wall. It probably is. It's probably, it's probably somebody's artwork, but it, it, you know, it helps you to think about the concept of patterns and textures and just the awesome, awesome beauty that could be in it. This, this other picture here, this is actually a tree trunk. Um, I didn't read about where it was or whatever, but th this is happening. This is a pattern and texture that happens naturally in nature, uh, probably rarely, uh, but it, and it's, I think it just has the symmetry. So there's a, definitely the patterns. And we talked about the rule of odds and we're going to get talk more about the rule of odds. But here's a great example of there's five points here. And then we have all these patterns and they're sort of, and they almost, it almost looks like you're looking down, uh, you know, from a aircraft or something at a set of pyramids in, in the earth. So it's kind of cool. 
Uh, and then stained glass makes a pretty cool pattern. And, and obviously these are, I don't know what kind of, I don't know if these are mag, magnetic, probably those magnetic uh, rocks that you can get at the novelty stores in a lot of tourist centers, uh, especially like in the Rockies and stuff. That's kind of what the, that looks like, that kind of gray metallic sort of materials, but really gives you a whole nice set of pattern and textures and it's of something that just occurs very naturally. And then there's the concept of, okay, so we had pattern and textures, but then what if there's just this one thing that steps out of pattern and textures that just breaks the pattern? And that all of a sudden, you know, that's a little discordant. But, you know, whereas this, this is oh, extremely mellow and very, very, very relaxing to, to see this and same here or this. It's very pleasing. It's sort of a natural feel. Here, it's like, well, what's that? You know, something's, you know, breaking the pattern. So, and obviously the orange juice or whatever in all the clear water, all of a sudden it just jumps out at you, right? Because it, it breaks the pattern. And that's something we as humans, we, we're, we're very pattern matching sort of folks. So when there's the odd thing out, uh, the Where's Waldo sort of thing, it jumps out at you oftentimes. So th something to think about as you're composing things. You, there might have been like more plants around here, but you, if you zoomed in just enough, then you're like, like you have this wonderful pattern with just that one thing that really jumps out. And if you think about it in terms of rule of thirds, it's pretty close to that, you know, intersection of the right third and the bottom third. And there that item is. So pretty cool. Now, we talked about the rule of odds, or I mentioned the rule of odds, and this is where we actually will talk about the rule of odds. And what is the rule of odds? And that, it basically says, in, print, in general, and these rules are not really rules, they're sort of just general guidance. Um, oftentimes, let's put it that way, rather than a rule, oftentimes, an odd number of things makes a more pleasing, interesting picture than an even number of things. If we had just two sprouts here instead of the three, don't know if the picture would be nearly as interesting. If we had just two die instead of the three, I don't think the picture would be as interesting. Now you could make a claim, and I think fairly, that if you had the mama bird feeding one chick, uh, the rule of thirds, uh, the, you know, the, the fact that it's a mom bird feeding the chick would probably be very, very interesting. Uh, having the two chicks in the mama bird gives us three subjects. I think just maybe a little bit makes it a little bit more interesting, tells a different, certainly tells a different tale than if it was a mama feeding a single chick. Uh, we have the five, I'm not sure these are, there's some, Predatory bird, they they might very well be eagles, uh, California eagles maybe, but sundown and you have five of them. And if you thought about it, if you only had four of them, would that be as nice? I don't think it would. Five makes a difference. And that has to do with the rule of odds. And, and here's an example of, we have this group, we have this group, and then we have this one person. Well, and so you talk about rule of odds, that's sort of odd that she didn't match the pattern of the other. She's a little, and later on we talk about juxtaposition, and this is a good example of also of just a, ju, juxtaposition and the fact that she doesn't really fit the rest of the pattern there. She's juxtaposed to the rest of the pattern that's there. But we have one group, we have two groups, and then we have this person here sort of the third or the odd out, but they're sort of, she's sort of bookended by these uh, two groups of priests. So that's a rule of odds and something to think about. Another thought is the whole concept of when you're composing things, try it on occasion to fill the frame. Get, get either physically close or zoomed with your camera lens or using uh, a long enough telephoto that you're just, your subject matter is almost a subset of the entire subject matter. And this is a great example. 
Instead of taking a picture of the person's face where both eyes are in focus and everything else, your subject matter, this is a very narrow depth of field, right? This is rock solid and in, in focus and beautiful. And this one is definitely way out of focus already. You can tell what it is, but it's way out of focus. Um, but we talked about color. So this is using a sense of colors and those colors are not discordant. So they kind of work with each other. We're filling the frame. We have this eye at about a third of the frame. And actually, it might actually, if we mapped it to a golden triangle, might actually be right there in, in a sort of a loop of what is the golden triangle. But uh, <laughs> it's a great shot. So that's why I put it in there. Um, this this was, I thought, a really overwhelming shot. You had to look at this shot because this, this looks like it could be a giant hole in the earth, but you, you notice that there are eyelashes here and there's the cornea, the outside of the eye right here. So obviously somebody got extremely co close at a different viewpoint. So at the angle of the shot, which we'll talk about later too, is very, this isn't a straight on, this is a different angle to the shot. All of that makes this shot really interesting, great shot. Uh, here we fill the frame with the cat, make sure the cat's eyes are in focus, narrow depth of field, because the front of the cat is actually very soft focus and we're seeing very soft focus in the back half, but the, this part of the face and the eyes of the cat are dead sharp. And then we have these two folks in, and again, black and white. And um, we'll talk more about black and white and why I like black and white so much, but I really do like black and white a lot. I think, I think if you want to make a dramatic picture, an artful picture, if you will, oftentimes people will lean towards black and white. But in both cases, we're, we're seeing so much character come through in this black and white picture. We're just seeing it through their eyes, through the wrinkles in their faces, through, it's really telling us a lot about a life they've lived already. And this gentleman looks like he's, you know, lived some, some challenges and he looks wise to me. He looks like somebody that's, that's gone through some really, you know, challenging times and come out the wiser for it. And it just, I love this picture. I think to me, it just tells, tells a whole lifetime story in a shot. Love that. And this, this picture here just sort of it forcing us to focus on the eye. Um, I think it's great that we have the hair. It's almost the hair is almost like negative space, but it's given us context about the age of this young lady. And uh, but it's the eye obviously jumps out, and it's only the one eye. And then the texture of the skin. They they you, there's ways you can take a picture and have it where the skin is very smooth, and they didn't they chose to show basically every pore. Um, and it sort of gives you a little grittier feel, uh, but I, I just find it a compelling shot uh, picture. And again, uh, you're filling the whole frame. There's nothing outside of a part of that person's face that's in the frame, is that in the shot. So, so that filled the frame. And here we just, talk about angle of view. And this was a great example of angle of view. They were they were not shooting right at a person's eye, directly at it. They were coming at, at it at an angle. Oops. And here we, we're looking at angle of view. And and so not don't think about every time you take a picture, taking a picture where you're standing up and you're holding the camera to your eye, because that's a picture that everybody sees you know, 95, 98% of the time. So you got to think about what what's different. What if I put the camera on the ground and faced it up? You know, that sometimes that might mean you're lying on the ground or maybe you're lying on your back on the ground to hold the picture and, and do it. Maybe you're on another landing looking down at your subject. Who And this is cool. This is depth of field again. Looks like he's reaching for a card. He's either throwing the card or reaching to catch the card. Uh, card's definitely out of focus. His fingertips are out of focus. His face is tack sharp, perfectly sharp. And then the rest of the body is drifting out of focus. And then obviously the background is all bokeh and out of focus. And this just tells a wonderful story. And honestly, um, 
the face is pretty close to dead center, not quite dead center, but it is on the upper third of the picture, so it's partially the rule of thirds, if you will. So if I cut this picture horizontally by thirds, his his eyes go right across that middle third. So that part is good, but they, they are they centered it. Makes all the sense in the world to me that that face is mostly centered. This is a great picture. I think we've talked about this picture before. I like this picture. Uh, another picture again where uh, instead of you can certainly take a you know get down low and take a shot of a child at the shot at the child's eye level, and I encourage you to do this. But this is another way to to look too, which is to take a picture of the child where the child is truly looking up because that tells quite a story. And again, depth of field. Notice how this is all out of focus. This, if we draw, draw that, this a line at about a third of the top third of the picture, that line goes right through those child's eyes and they're tack sharp. And that's what we want. And the flower is in focus as well. So there's some layers there, some depth of field there. Obviously it's a black and white, which I love. Um, and it, it's a different kind of angle. And here's another different kind of angle. We're looking at this gentleman walking the streets of this city. Uh, so we're seeing these beautiful buildings. We're seeing it's a beautiful day outside. But this is an example of, of giving us something rather than to meet this person face to face. We're, we're basically getting a ground level view of what this gentleman is doing as he walks the city. Uh, we all see trees like this. Uh, oftentimes we're, we're standing farther away. Uh, this is a, not very uh, unusual, a pretty typical way of shooting trees, but it does give you that perspective. You know, everything concaves to the center. I love the fact that they were able to get the sun with a sun star. Uh, usually to do that, you need a pretty decent lens and usually you're going to close your aperture down. So this might be like an F16 or an F22 where it's a, your pupil of your lens is very narrow and the, uh, the shuttering of that pupil with the overlap of the diaphragms on the aperture gives you the result of that star on a high quality lens. So that's how you can get that star shaped sun. And then obviously this is a bird's eye view. Now, if you have a drone, I don't wish it did, or a hang glider, I don't, glad I don't. <laughs> or a small plane or a large plane, um, you can get this way. You know, a lot of us have flown in planes and used our cell phones and taken pictures like this, and these are cool. Um, if uh, Sometimes if you're... Uh, in the mountains, you can see a valley and it looks very similar to this. So I have pictures uh, from mountain drives where I looked down in the valley and got sort of that bird's eye view um, but again. But again, it's a different way to look. Or if you're in the city and the tall buildings, uh, sometimes taking a shot of the city, obviously, uh, is a great way to get a different angle of view of the city itself. Uh, shallow depth of field. We've been talking about depth of field as we've gone along. And again, depth of getting a shallow depth of field, again, is getting the aperture of your camera to open very wide. So it's letting in a lot of light. Um, and that uh, narrows down, the nature of the aperture narrows down the amount of space that can be in focus at one time especially as you get closer to things. So in this case, this was probably done with a macro lens, which is made for very close-ups. And uh, that's going to cause the depth of field to be very, very narrow so that the eyes on this fly, I'm assuming it's a fly, uh, are in focus. God, you got to look at how many eyes those things have. It's unbelievable. Uh, but the rest of the body and even the legs and the limb that it's on are out of focus. Very shallow depth of field. This picture down below is a very famous picture. It was taken in Afghanistan. But this picture is uh, was always uh, attracted a lot of attention because people found these, these green emerald eyes to be just mesmerizing. It has to do with color. We talked about color as well, right? 
So the actual color of the eyes, obviously the humanity of the eyes, you can see the, a very, you know, a person is telling, the face is telling us about a, a story there of a troubled face, if you will. It doesn't look happy. It doesn't necessarily look sad. It looks very somber, very serious. Like somebody that's for, for you know, much too young is dealing with some very major things in their lives. And that's the story I'm reading from this face. But the eyes just pose the color with the red scarf and the, and then but then align and mesh with the green backgrounds. And then you have the dark hair. So it just sort of just all those colors jump out at you. Rule of thirds, we draw a line across the third of the, there are those eyes. Rule third here, there's this eye there. So awesome picture, very, very famous picture. Uh, and very shallow depth of field. We can't tell what's going on behind her. Whoops. Um, very shallow depth of field in the hook here. We're just seeing that and all those hooks blend off. Um, the clock, clock is in focus again. Oh, I keep hitting my mouse button, sorry. We'll get to those other pictures in a minute. If we draw a line down the third uh, there, this is definitely in the third part, uh, you know, the left third of the, uh, so we have this negative space to the right. Uh, the clock is looking there. So we're using that negative space in accordance with, in, in you know, harmony with uh, the way the clock is facing. Uh, and again, very narrow depth of field. These things behind there are out of focus, but they make sense with the clock being in front of the focus. That's another thing we, we'll talk about later is making sure your background, watch your background, be careful that the background is is in a, you know, in a line with what you're trying to do in the foreground. Uh, and this last picture on a shallow depth of field is this wonderful yellow songbird, canary, whatever it is, on top of a sunflower seed. And these are very much in focus, but then you see this wonderful background, blur background, which is called Boca, B-O-K-E-H, Boca. Um, very soft. So this was taken with a, with a nice camera lens set up to give you a very pleasing sort of uh, off, off, out of focus bokeh like that. So that's shallow depth of field. And then the idea of taking depth one more step where the depth, we don't have shallow depth of field, but we actually have a lot of depth of field where a lot of uh, the picture is in focus. And there we want to make sure that if we're doing that, what's in focus in the foreground and what's in focus in the background tells a consistent story. So we're just, you know, giving us sort of from the beginning to the end. This, a lot of landscape focus, uh, pictures are like this. These are both landscape pictures, obviously. Are very much like this. You'll tend, whereas we, we shot the narrow depth of focus pictures with an aperture wide open with where, where we want our landscape pictures to be all in focus like this, our aperture is shut down. So this is more like an F8, maybe an F11 uh, aperture, and which would put most all of the, our uh, subject content in focus. But then also we want to make sure that when we're telling the story that <laughs> there's something worthwhile for the viewer to see in the beginning and and at you know in the in the foreground as well as in the background and also in here we can kind of see some leading lines they're a little windy but there's leading lines we can also get pretty close to the rule of thirds by copying this carving this picture horizontally into thirds and seeing layers that are about a third a piece same with this picture if we copy it uh, crop it if we were to Draw lines across the third and the third. This top piece is the, the last top third and the, the water and everything is the bottom two thirds. But this whirlpool here, a little where the water's flooding over the rocks, is really the bottom third. And this this is in focus. This um, The shutter speed could have been a little bit faster, but I think they, they ran a slower shutter speed to have the water smooth itself out. So the water, that's why you see the water feels a little uh, smooth, if you will, but the rocks are definitely rock solid and in focus. So 
Uh, this is an example where we're seeing a story in the foreground and a story in the background, and so it's really telling us a story all the way through. Negative space. And I, I got a couple of really wonderful, wonderful black and white pictures as part of this. Uh, um, three black and white pictures, as a matter of fact, talking about negative space. Um, and so with negative space, it's really letting space be a huge, huge part of the story. Um, and it's probably no better example. Here we have an example of a person, dead center in the shot, dead center in the shot. But, and then they're using vignetting and you see some and vignetting is darkening around the, the outside of the picture. And you see vignetting here. You'll see some vignetting here. It's not as, as dramatic, but it's definitely there. And just a skosh of vignetting here as well. Um, so, and, and that's and a lot of times either your camera will do it or you can add that post uh, uh, processing in the, in the picture. But this is a silhouette as well. This is a concept of a silhouette. Uh, and, and the fact that all you see is shapes and um, the light, letting the light form the shapes. We have this wonderful pattern. We have pattern and texture here too, right? Beautiful pattern and texture, wonderful. Um, it just tells a, a, a great story. Um, and all of this negative space is, it just tells, it's such a soulful, lost, almost like um, a human lost in the, in the, you know, buildings of, of mankind, right? It's almost a brutalist story, the architecture, the architecture that looks, you know, hard and flat and very square edges and stuff is called brutalist architecture. And this, this person looks like they're lost in a brutalist world. And this person does too. It's wonderful with the light shining on them directly. So whereas this is in silhouette, this isn't in silhouette because we can see this skin in the face of this person. And it's such a beautiful picture. And they're like standing in the light where there is no other light for them to stand. She's standing in the light. So I suspect she's on stage. But the way that picture's lit, you don't know for sure. And the rest of the building looks very brutalist like this, very, very negative. So it's very cold. And it, and you end up with this one human there that's bringing humanity to the shot that otherwise would be very, very stark. Uh, this picture, the, the, the floor, we'll assume she's laying on the floor, looks wooden. So this looks more natural, a little warming. Uh, an interesting picture in the fact that they left so much. A lot of times you would like, well, let's crop this picture and we'll make it all about her. But this is a very creative use of negative space. This is telling a story of somebody that has room in her life, if you will, right now. She's laying on a floor that has room for her to lay on the floor. And she's happy. This is a beautiful picture. She's happy. If we do the thirds by the thirds, their picture, her face is right there, right? A third by a third. Beautiful, beautiful structure there. And then a terrific use of negative space with a little bit of vignetting that's drawing our attention. And that's the darkening of the color of the edge of the picture, which is drawing our attention to her face and her eyes. And her eyes are tack sharp. Really, the whole child is in is in focus and the floor itself is pretty close to being in focus. So great picture. Here's a picture of a predator out on a snowy cliff. You know, if we did a third, whoops, uh, if we did a third line, it'd be right there. Uh, the third line here would get there about their feet, but that predator's right there. And then all the negative space is out here. Uh, and, and so, and that's the way that bird is looking. So, it makes sense for that negative space to be out there. Um, but it really, it, it's a stark picture. And it's cold picture because it's wintertime. And that really tells a story. So that's, that's negative spaces. Think about that as uh, you use it. Black and white. Did I, did I mention my fondness for black and white? I love black and white. 
uh, it, it pictures like this, just emphasize why I love black and white. You look at this beautiful flower. When you get black and white, when you take the color out of things, you start to really see, I think, more of a picture in a lot of, a lot of times. Um, that the true picture oftentimes comes out when the color goes out. And, and you start to see the lines and the textures and the things that really are the substance of, of, of the picture, of the organic life that was around us. Um, you see this horse, and I think a more, much more dramatic uh, uh, looking appearance than if this was in color. I just don't think you'd have nearly the drama of a picture. So an art, you know, if you're thinking about pictures that are fine art, uh, that are more dramatic, they tend to be black and white. And here we see again, this has got some vignetting, that darkening around the outside. Drawing an eye to the picture of the horse. The horse is definitely off-centered. We drew a line down the third, be pretty much there, a line across. Horse's head would be pretty much there. Uh, so it's using the rule of thirds, using black and whites. Uh, has a little vague netting in there. Whereas this picture, the flower picture, is very, very much centered. But you see a lot of pattern and textures in here. Um, and it makes a lot of sense for the way this shot is composed to for it to be centered. And the whole flower is in the picture, which is a really good thing. This picture here is a very, very famous picture by Ansel Adams, a very famous naturalist. Uh, he, he shot a lot of uh, the Yosemite Valleys, Valley, uh, the Grand Tetons. Um, I think Yosemite Valley, Grand Tetons. And the Southwest uh, was where he was very famous for taking pictures. This is one of the most famous pictures of Ansel Adams and it's a Snake River Canyon picture. So this is the Grand Tetons in the back uh, mountains here. And this is the Snake River winding its way in front of the Grand Tetons. And there is a stop on a road, and I've been there a couple of times, uh, that will set you up for to see this. Unfortunately, they don't cut down the weeds in front of your uh, picture place. So, um, so this part of the river oftentimes is kind of covered with weeds nowadays when you stop there, but it's a you know a very famous picture for a lot of reasons. Uh, and he got it right towards a sundown when the sun was right behind these clouds on a day when it was partially stormy. I mean, it was just all kinds of drama in this picture. This picture of the, the little girl with the leaf, wonderful picture. Notice how there's a lot of darkness and vignetting around here, but then in the center, you're drawing your eyes to her very very dramatic. The black and white, I think, really makes this picture jump out at you much more so than if it was in color. And I think even though you don't, uh, uh, and I've got a smaller copy of this picture on the slide here, but it, in the totality, her eyes don't loom large in this picture, but you certainly see them. They jump out at you. So that face, that cherub face, if you will, sort of jumps right out at you. Uh, and this picture here, again, very dramatic, like a white, and it, it goes to what we just talked about in negative space, right? Another example of a picture filled with negative space, but then lighting breaking up the pattern. So we had a lot of darkness here, lighting breaking up the pattern. It's humanized, by we have an individual here, but that individual is in silhouette. We really can't tell their face. So they're basically a silhouette of a person. Very dramatic. Great example of black and white. Love black and white. Uh, another thing to think about in your compositions is simplicity. Uh, keeping things simple or minimalist. And here's some great examples of minimalist sort of pictures. We have a yellow, we have a pattern here. These aren't so much leading lines, but they are a pattern of lines. because They're not leading lines because they don't really lead us through the picture. They sort of stop us from scanning the picture in a way. Uh, but we have this, you know, green leaf jumping out, uh, which is breaking the pattern. So that's an example of something that breaks the pattern. It's also a very simple picture. It's also a picture of uh, 
of something being juxtaposed in the picture. So this is a juxtaposition example as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, here's a great example of a very, very simple picture. Uh, notice that there's, in these examples, there's no humans. I didn't put simplify and I could have. And it's an interesting question. If you put a person into a picture where the goal is simplify, it's a really challenging thing to do. You can do it, but it's a really challenging thing to do. If you're trying to do a simplify picture and it's just inanimate things, oftentimes it's easier to make a simple picture. The church example, the boat at anchor in a quiet bay, reflection, lots of surrounded by negative space, uh, the flowers in a pot, uh, you know, surrounded by all kinds of negative space that drifts off into something incoherent. You don't really even know what's behind there. All these are very simple minimalistic pictures. The inverse of that <laughs> is very busy pictures, maximalism, if you will. Uh, so if you have minimalism, you can have very, very busy pictures. And they can be overwhelming pictures. Uh, and probably you'll see more people that are more comfortable and, and, and intrigued by this. And oftentimes, something like this, if, especially when you can't resolve, this picture isn't quite so bad because there's patterns here. There's the three pictures apart. There's the three sections of the sofa, the three pillows. The rule of odds is working for us there. Um, the, you know, there's, there's patterns there. It's busy, but there's patterns. This uh, looks like a junk drawer. <laughs> I'm not sure what to make of it. So it's very discordant to look at. Uh, this isn't as discordant, but it's busy. Um, so this is somewhat of a maximalist in this fact is as I look around and look around, there's just a lot of stuff to look at. And oftentimes that makes it a tiring picture because there's, there's nothing I can necessarily relax to. Certainly these other two pictures are the same way. There's nothing to relax to. Uh, so you, you have to decide what it is you're trying to get out of your composition. Uh, this, a maximalist or very busy picture, is a really challenging thing to do well. Use of layers. In this picture here, the top picture, we have a foreground layer, you know, and then a near foreground layer. And we just look one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, about a dozen layers here. And what I love is there is, in very tiny space, a person out there that's given a scale, that's telling us an idea that, hey, humans travel here. Looks like it. You have to be a hardy human to do it, but you can do it. And this is the size of humans in this scale of layers. Very, very interesting. Uh, this is an example of layers with a lot of people. I think this is probably in South America. They look like folks that native to South America. Um, and we sort of have layers that start from the right and work itself left. And they get a little farther away until they're actually behind the door. Uh, in this picture here, we have uh, grass that's out of focus in the foreground. We have grass that's completely more in focus. Uh, you know, it's a separate layer. We have a layer where the horses are and the crosses. A little bit behind there's another layer with the tree and additional layers filling out the far, for, you know, background. And then we get to, you know, the low sky and the high sky as well. Lots of layers in there. Uh, in this picture here, we have layers where, you know, we have the water fountain in the foreground. We have a watch deck over here in the midground. Uh, looks like a canyon here in the midground. And then out in the background, we have all these trees and paths and wonderful colors. This one is an interesting one. I, you know, you could argue whether or not it fits in this use of layers. I think it does. Uh, the foreground is out of focus. We have very narrow depth of focus. It's a beautiful picture, so I drew it in here. I like it. I think this is a professional studio shot. Somebody, somebody did a wonderful shot. Uh, and it tells a hum great human story. It's a, I'm thinking it's a sister kissing either a little sister or a little brother. And uh, and then obviously depth of field is very narrow. So they're in focus, their entire bodies are in focus. This is a great use 
of depth of field. And what you do to do that is you open up your aperture again, very wide, and then you step back far enough that these children are all in focus. And then you take the picture because that will leave the foreground that's next to you out of focus, leave the background deeply out of focus. But your subjects, these children are right in focus and it's great use of layers that way. Balancing elements, a little nuance here, but this is the idea that, hey, I've got this very dramatic light post in the front side and I have this Ferris wheel that sort of plays off of it on a minor chord. So I have a major chord on the left, a minor chord on the right. Um, and not that I'm very good musically, but I know <laughs> more musical people talk about that uh, over here in the Ferris wheel. And they're sort of balance each other. Here we have, we have the seascape balanced with the sky. So it's sort of balancing element. We have uh, the sky isn't just blue and it has the sky with wonderful colors. It is close to sundown. So the clouds are all lit and that lights the, it lights the sand on the beach. And then, you know, the balancing element is the, the clouds lit in the sky. Very much the same sort of thing here. We have balancing element in the turbulence in the water in front of us balanced by the sunshine over here. And we also have the balance of the, of the water and the beach against the, you know, the wonderful colors in the sky. And then here we, we have our major subject. Again, if we did thirds and thirds is he, that tower is right there, but this third and this lower third. So it goes from here to this third sort of balanced by this foreground rock. So it's an example of a, giving us depth by foreground and background, balancing elements and, and some, uh, in a nice composition, I like this picture a lot. Ah, and we talked about juxtaposition and here's some examples of that. And that's where things are, are just seemed a little out of place, if you will. So, one of these guys is out of place, right? I mean, this is very much a juxtaposed. And then, and then we have a young woman who's, you know, sort of soft and, and uh, I think the features are a little bit more gentle against juxtaposed against this young man who's got kind of a ready, you know, whiskered look to himself. Um, and I think you have the blue eye juxtaposed with the brown eye. And even her eye is more, di this is interesting to me. Her eye is more dilated in this same room, in this same photographer than his eye is. His eye is not dilated nearly as much. So that's quite a discordant or juxtaposition between each other. This is a clever thing. And if you have older pictures of yourself, you can do this, you can try this yourself. You print one out. So this gentleman, uh, I think he's an actor. I think this guy's famous. Um, I think a photographer had an older picture of him that he had him hold up in front of his face so that he could adjust to pose himself, his younger self against his current older self. Great shot. Very clever. Black and white. Uh, awesome shot. Uh, this is sort of breaking the pattern here as well, but it's a just position as well because it's all of a sudden right where there is a spike, we have this tree juxtaposed right behind it. So that's also breaking the pattern sort of thing too. And then obviously we have a beach and then we have a lone ice cube, if you will, or mostly alone, I guess it's a little ice cube there. So we have a little bit of an ice left on the beach. So we have this very dark, gritty, stony beach and this very clear crystalline piece of ice there. So juxtaposition. Uh, background content. Very, very important to remember and look at your back. Uh, I get burnt on more shots because I don't keep in mind my background. Got to keep in mind what's in your background. Have the background help to tell the story. This is a wonderful, just wonderful picture. We have this one child looking right at us, sitting in the chair. She's in focus. Most of her upper body's in focus. Her, I'm, I'm assuming these are siblings or cousins. 
are not in focus, but they're they're trailing off in becoming less and less focused. But way behind there is, I think that's a Chevy, if, if memory, it might be a Ford. Uh, but there's an old 19, early 50s, late 40s, um, Ford or Chevy American built car. Pretty sure it's American built. Uh, and it, and that really, and so it's kind of telling us this picture is kind of older, uh, like as not. This is probably an older picture, but it, the background is telling us they're out in the country somewhere. They live where they have a pretty nice car, um, but it fits, the background fits uh, everything. And this gentleman here, this black and white, the background is very busy, but it, it he's, he's a, He's doing things with his tool. He's a carpenter or, or furniture maker, and he's got all these tools. And so this is the story of this guy working in his on his craft, you know, making wooden furniture. And here's all the tools that he uses to do that. So great picture. Down here in the lower left, we have, you know, icicle, and it probably is getting that part of winter where it leads to spring because this almost looks like it melted and froze again. But it definitely, the icicle that we're seeing in the foreground is supported by the fact that in the background, it's still winter or early spring and the snow is still on the ground behind it. Um, this is a great picture of a wedding shot where very dramatic, uh, but there's nothing discordant in the back of the background. This makes a wonderful background, wonderful story. Uh, this is a wonderful background here, and it kind of tells us that wherever this nun and these children are playing, it's it's somewhere as old and somewhere that had seen more troubling times, right? The building, the building has either worn over age or likely worn uh, due to surviving war times, and so they're now at the point where they can take a break from all of that and enjoy some kind of ball if that's basketball or what it is but uh but that background is really helping to tell this story and supports the story and then this is a very very famous picture of the depression in the united states in the 1930s the great depression this is a mother with her two children in the background although not very focused is basically telling us they're living in a tent and so it very much fits with the sort of down uh, challenge, downtrodden, down challenged, poor, if you will, uh, position this woman is in. And uh, the depression in the 1930s was really tough. People didn't have nearly enough to eat. Um, some people did actually starve to death. Uh, but it wasn't unusual for people to be migrants. They lived in tents and they, uh, and they moved about the country until they could find something with more permanence and give themselves a chance to chance to work. Some great stories uh, come out of the Great Depression. And and if you're a country music fan like I am, some of the best country artists of uh, the 50s, 60s, and 70s came out of being children of the Great Depression. And, um, and they tell great stories of what their life was like to overcome that. Decisive moments. So as you're composing this, this is the hardest thing to compose. This is have your camera ready. And if you're in a situation where things are happening fast, get the shutter speed fast. So set the shutter speed to 1200 or 2000 or even 3000 if your camera will support it. Because if you only have that one moment and you want to freeze it in time, you have to have a sharp shutter speed and you just have to be ready to shoot. And if your camera is one that will let you shoot, you know, a bunch of shots consecutively, uh, you know, in a fast shutter speed, do that. Because you'll get, you might have to look through 20 shots or 30 shots or 50 shots for that one shot that is the keeper, that is the maker, that is the reason you took it. Um, this top left photo, very famous photo of a prisoner from of war from Vietnam. A lot of those guys were prisoners of war for four, five, six, up to eight or nine years. 
uh, and they were finally released at the end when the peace treaty was signed in 1972. And they were released and brought home. And this is a gentleman having landed in a U.S. airport. And this is his wife and his four kids running to greet him. And they hadn't seen him. In this For this gentleman, it was like five or six years. So, uh, I mean, if you think about it, these children were very small when their father went away to war and they didn't see him for five or six years. They didn't even know if he was alive. So, very emotional picture. Um, th I saw this picture growing up and it made a big impact on me. Obviously, weddings, we've been to a lot of weddings. This is a great, uh, decisive moment, the perfect time. Got the flowers at Apogee, a beautiful setting in the background for this picture. And you got all the bridesmaids looking up, trying to catch a, the shot. You have the gentleman lunging uh, to score a goal. And it looks like Australian football to me. This is a very famous World War II picture. The Navy gentleman kissed a nurse on Times Square at the announcement that the Japanese had surrendered. So this was VJ Day. August of 1945. And a very famous picture was in Life magazine. A number of people claimed to have been the subjects of both parties, the guy and the gal. I don't think it was ever resolved for sure who these two were, uh, but it was a picture that's lived through the decades. This picture, I think it's kind of a famous picture, but I don't know the story behind it. And then this picture, I believe, happened um, in 1956. Uh, there was a brief moment in time where Hungary rebelled uh, from the Eastern Bloc of communist countries. And for a few hours, there was a chance for Hungary, for Hungarians to sneak across the border, across the barbed wire, if you will, and into freedom. And I'm trying to think where they would have probably into West Germany, I believe. I'd have to look at the map again. I actually went to school uh, with a young woman that did escape uh, from Hungary in that brief moment in time her family escaped. So an interesting uh, moment in time. Otherwise, they had to wait until uh, 1989 and the fall of the Soviet Union before they were able to be free. And the last one, what I want to wrap with is when you're composing your pictures, think about putting humans in the picture. I'll, you know, when I was younger, I took pictures, and a lot of times I'd wait until people left, and then I'd take a picture of the scene. And what I've learned over the years is probably don't really want to do that. You really want to have a person in the picture. They may not be the focus. They may not be huge in the picture. They may be, but they may not be. But you want them in there. This bridge is a great example. It's a beautiful shot. I think it's a better shot because we have these two people right here walking across it. I think that really makes the picture. If we took those out, that picture wouldn't be nearly as impactful. This is a beautiful picture. It's much more impactful with the guy in the boat than if the boat was just sitting there empty. Um, it humanizes it, makes it much more interesting. Obviously, this picture is the person holding the umbrella. So, and this picture obviously is this young, this handsome young man with his eyes, searing eyes looking right at you. And all in the story is all these young, other young folks uh, behind there. And then here you have a picture of somebody, they feel like it's like they're going home from the grocery store and the sun's going down. Um, so it's a beautiful sunset, but what, really makes the picture is the person walking their bike through that sunset on the way home. That's telling a story. So in all of your composition, whenever possible, I'd say err on the side of, of putting the human interest into the picture. Put, give us context of what your picture is. So with all of that, that was a lot, probably went on longer than I should have. I enjoyed having the opportunity to speak to you today about photography composition. And if you get a chance, uh, like the video, if you would. It's kind of nice people do. 
Um, you can hit subscribe. I don't know how many of these I'll do, but you can hit subscribe. I'd be complimented if you did. I, I, I'm very new to YouTube. Well, not totally new to YouTube, but I don't do YouTube very much. Uh, but also feel free to comment as long as your comment is, it's not rude. I mean, you can be harsh on me and tell me how to do things better or I could be better at it. That's fine. Uh, just don't, uh, don't be rude. Don't criticize the photographs because they're beautiful photographs and, and like I say, there are, there are other people's work that we are borrowing for, for the purposes of education. So with all of that, on behalf of the Kenosha County 4-H uh, group and Kenosha County 4-H photography, uh, this has been Roger Sherman, the leader of Kenosha County 4-H photography. Thanks and have a great day.